So good morning, everybody. It is uh, 7 a.m. Central European time in Germany, but also good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you will join us from. My name is um, Rolf Schwind. I'm the CEO of um, Schwind IT Solutions, and uh, I would like to welcome you to our webinar three. Uh, after organizing uh, two webinars in the last weeks, where we received uh, the huge attendance and positive feedback, feedback, we decided to continue offering webinars also in the near future. Today's topic is um, first um, a description of the pandemic actual situation per country, which you know is quite different. And uh, the, the second topic is um, what chances, opportunities, maybe risks, will we have uh, after pandemic? We uh, have been able to convince a brilliant moderator. This is uh, Professor John Marshall from London. And um, John, I would like really like to thank you uh, to take this over. And um, uh, very soon uh, we can give you the leadership of our webinar. But first, um, I would, would like to give the, uh, the word to Thomas um, for some uh, organizational um, items. Thank you very much and have a, a, a nice one and a half hour with us. Yeah, good morning also from my side and a warm welcome from, me, from my side. I also would like to thank you, uh, Professor John Marshall, as a moderator and thank you all of our uh, speakers, reverends, and you, of course, as our attendees, because uh, you are also on the computer right now and it might be early in the morning or late on the night. It's six o'clock in the morning, so I guess you wake up very early. But the sun was maybe earlier than you because we can see the sun in the background. Professor John Marshall, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas and uh, Rolf. Uh, it's a great delight for me to act as moderator in this um, session. I guess I've been telling everybody no one could have imagined that in the 21st century, we'd have our own version of the Black Death. Uh, in London, we had the Great Plague in 1665, and the Lord Mayor of London's regulations in 1665 are almost identical to those of our present Prime Minister for the COVID issue. We got rid of the Great Plague by setting fire to London and destroying most of the city in the Great Fire of London, uh, 1666. I'm not sure we're going to do that with COVID. Uh, we have a model in terms of a really uh, dreadfully infectious disease killing millions of people throughout the world in 1918, but very few people know what happened in the recovery from that pandemic. So I very much look forward to the speakers here this morning telling us what's happening around the world as we slowly ease off the regulations and restrictions that we've all had. Uh, it, I'm sure we're all going to learn lessons from each other, and I'm sure that the speakers will emphasize the importance of telemedicine and keeping ourselves safe as well as our patients safe. So I guess we should go to the first uh, speaker. There's been a slight reorganization here because of the time zone change. And so Enrique from Mexico, he is our first speaker. Uh, hello, Enrique. everyone. Uh, good morning, good uh, evening, good night to everyone. Thank you so much, Mr. Sh Thomas. Uh, Professor, on the invitation to speak on the situation in Mexico, I'm, I'm from Mexico, and uh, right yes. right now we are we are living a very special situation. So I think before we start, uh, it might be important to review some of the considerations published by the American Academy. This was just reviewed uh, to, for me yesterday, for you guys, or for most of you guys, the day before yesterday. Um, it's just the standard surgical personal protective equipment. That that's including a, a conventional surgical mask is sufficient for most cases. And surgeons may choose or not, depending on the situation and the availability, to wear an N95 mask. 
Well, this, this remains controversial, and uh, in, at least in our settings, testing a patient for COVID still, still is controversial. But if a patient is positive, um, the, sur the surgery should probably be delayed for more than a month, six weeks, the academy says. Uh, and the surgeon, if the surgery needs to be done, uh, the surgeon must wear an N95 mask and uh, probably eye protection. If the PCR is negative, then the surgery can move on. And if there's a negative serologic testing, I felt, I'm sorry, if there's a serology, positive serology, which is not very reliable to decide on, on whether surgery should be uh, proceeded on or not. Some hospitals may even require more than two negative PCRs and a, a, a long period of symptom-free um, time in, uh, uh, to, in order to proceed with surgery. There's a special chapter on, on, on laser procedures or refractive surgery. And you must remember that, that the virus may not be even cultured after the, uh, after, uh, after the surgery from the plume itself. And most eczema lasers have a uh, HEPA filter that aspirate the virus. So uh, at this time, the, the risk for the surgeon is certainly low, but there's still a risk for surgery to be performed. Now, speaking with, uh, of Mexico, Mexico is at the heart of the epidemic right now. Uh, we are learning from all of you what's happened at the rest of the world. We are continuously increasing. To the, this is the tonight's graph uh, showing that the cases, uh, that, that right now we have more than 70,000 confirmed cases, but because testing is not widely available in the country, there is some estimation that this number m must be multiplied by even 10 or 30. So, so uh, we're looking at a prevalence or, or an incidence of, of so from 700,000 to more than 2 million infections in the country right now, tonight. Our hospital is based in Mexico City, and because Mexico City is one of the, it's the largest city in, 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 in the country, this is where it's placed, right in the center of the country. Uh, we're in the middle or, or the high peak of the epidemic, of the, of the epidemic and um, it's a very interesting time to say the least. So let me just briefly speak about our hospital. It's a one institute and four small clinics in the country. Two of them have refractive surgery. There's more than 120 voluntary ophthalmologists with over 65 residents and fellows. Before COVID, we had only in Mexico City, we had, we had more than 2,000 call students per day. So today, we're working only on an emergency basis. So we only see 150 patients, patients per day. Before COVID, we did 1,000 surgeries per month. Now we're only doing 150, only on emergency basis. Um, obviously, the staff and the all ophthalmologists and Ali personnel wear shields, goggles, masks, gloves. There's a daily screening for staff, uh, which includes uh, taking temperature, symptoms, and uh, asking uh, if, there's, if there has been any contacts with COVID positive. Uh, uh, family or, 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 or contacts itself. Uh, we're working on a shift basis. We work one week of work, and then we get three weeks off to go home and isolate. And that's, that's this is for residents as well. And during that, during those those three weeks, they have to, or we have to stay symptom free, and there have to be no reported cases of COVID in the household in order to return to work. What is a shutdown policy in our country? Uh, because health is considered an essential service, there hasn't been a lot that requiring the eye clinics or eye hospitals to close down. So, but we are working on an emergency basis only. Elective surgery has been re redirected or postponed. We have a, 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 a different, very small surgical facility, very controlled. So elective surgery can still be performed if, if the patient and the physician agree on. Uh, the estimated time in hospital had time has doubled. Uh, we have because of the screening and the cleaning procedures between patients, it takes a lot more time. And in the small surgical facility uh, with a, with a net, we can we can hold about ten patients at the same time in pre in, in, in the in the recovery room. So not today, there's no more, we do not allow more than two patients to be in the anesthetic recovery room. We have put in place some measures at the, at, in the big hospital. Uh, patients are screened at the entrance. 
uh, by a physician. They we take temperature. The waiting rooms, our waiting rooms usually hold 300, 400 persons per floor. Now, as you can see, the, the, the waiting rooms are have have been closed to, uh, in the, in, closed down or, or, or limited in space. And as, as I mentioned before, everybody has to be checked at the entrance before we go in. When will treatment start again? Uh, well, still elective surgery, as I mentioned, is still allowed. There's a specific COVID informed consent. Uh, we send them to the discovery pre facility, which with no reported infections on, on staff on the, and the personnel working in the clinic. Negative screening is, is mandatory for any surgery that has an anesthetic or a, 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 sed, or a sedative. This is, not, this is not applied for lasers. Uh, itself or not for laser, laser vision correction or any photocoagulation or, or anything similar. Patient has to have no respiratory symptoms for the, or fever for the last 14 days. And obviously with no contacts with COVID positive in the last 14 days. So what will change in our practice? Certainly there will be increased volume. There's increased turnover. Even if patients want to come in, the, 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 the time, the turnover time has increased a lot because of the cleaning procedures and you not know, cleaning the doorknobs and the floor every time the patient goes in and out. And the, this, there's a safe distance that that's mandatory by law. It has to be one and a half meters per patient uh, in, in any waiting room. So uh, there's only a small amount of patients that can come in. And we're working on building satellite screening sites. And this includes refractive surgery as well, where we put in topographies or uh, an optometry service that can quickly send the patient and use a online refractive screening consoles by using telemedicine. We were actually we're launching it on, on Friday for the first time. We'll see how it works. So the last two questions and which opportunities for laser vision correction do you see after the pandemic and which actions do you need to recommend to speed up market recovery? I think these two questions come together. Um, Obviously, we need to work and increase the awareness on, on, the, on, on laser vision correction safety for the public. Uh, you know, the, 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 people, the public needs to know that the hospital is covered free, that they're in a safe environment, that we're taking every precaution for them to be safe. And that we're working on, on, on the web and social media and advertisements, massive emails, etc. As, as I mentioned before, we're launching a telemedicine consultation um, on Friday. And we're working on increased referrals from optometry sites. Uh, and I, I think that's all on my side. Please stay safe and stay positive. We will come through this and, 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 and hopefully we'll come back to normal in the, in the next few months, I, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify one thing, that there's no regulation that has prohibited uh, elective surgery in your country is that right that is correct there's no there's no law that prohibits although the public's awareness is awareness is big there, there hasn't been any huge demand of elective elective surgery specifically for laser vision correction but you can still uh -huh. be it can still be performed if the physician and the patient agree on doing it uh, on the, on the, on, on, under this on, on, under the umbrella of the institution. Okay, that's that's very interesting because I think uh, a great many countries have um, introduced some sort of uh, legislative restriction. Uh, the other interesting thing is <clears throat> the distancing. Uh, some work in the 1930s said coughs and sneezes will spread up to nine meters. In the UK, we have two meters. Many other countries have 1.5 meters. And uh, I, I'm sure these are completely arbitrary measurements, but uh, congratulations on uh, your waiting room. It looked very good to me. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Marshall. Thank you. And perhaps we should go to the next speaker, who I think is David Kang. Well, hello, friends. First of all, it's good to see all of you well and healthy and of course we thank everyone especially those of you joining the webinar in the wee hours of the morning or late at night thank you very much now as john mentioned i know most of the world well some parts of the world was in lockdown with elective procedures legislatively banned by the authorities however we had i think a unique situation here in korea because the clinic was actually never shut down although we are still a long way from beating this 
pandemic with the necessary precautions that we actually took, I hope to share with all of you, we all may be practicing in a more safer uh, environment. Unfortunately, this is what the streets of Seoul look like during rush hour. Everybody is wearing masks. And I truly believe with washing hands frequently, these two are the only working vaccines from SARS-CoV-2 we have at the moment. And I'm quite glad the public are adhering quite well to this. If we look at that, our numbers here in my clinic, these are the numbers of the newly found patients from January to uh, as of this point newly diagnosed patients. As you see, the numbers exploded from February through March before the curve began to flatten around April. Yesterday, we had 30 newly identified patients, which means they were infected at a median of one week ago, so possibly around the 20th of May. Now, let's, let's look at the numbers of refractive procedures of the same months. The number of procedures performed were exactly inversely proportional to the number of newly found patients. The most dramatic decrease was in February, which traditionally is our hottest month of the year because we have Lunar New Year. Traditionally, these are there are more procedures in February than January, but it decreased by slightly north of 800 to 550. Revenue was compared to last year in February saw a drop of almost 30%. This is just refractive procedures we are talking about and does not include cataract procedures. Cataract patients have decreased by almost 90% compared to last year. The elderly mostly opting to stick to social distancing. April for us saw a stabilization of procedures with school teachers, flight attendants, and those whose workplace had shut down coming in for surgery while they could stay at home. Pre-op exams show the same trend, a decline in February and stabilization by April as the number of newly found patients decreased and the curve flattened. I think most of us exercise the same precautions checking for symptoms before allowing entry into the clinic not just for patients, but also for employees. Everyone is checked with ID and then rechecked on two online platforms. Of course, and the necessary symptomatic checks are of course carried out. A health questionnaire identification with passport uh, is filled in to leave behind a paper trail to see if, they, if these patients have any COVID related symptoms. The DUR and ITS systems actually proved to be very effective during this pandemic. These two online platforms, the DUR and the International Traveler Information System, are provided by the authorities. These systems tell us whether that a specific patient is on a list of those who should be in quarantine because they are part of contact tracing with a COVID positive patient or whether they have entered the country within the last two weeks in which circumstance they should also be in quarantine. So we can actually identify those who should be in quarantine if they attempt to enter the clinic beforehand. After cleaning the symptoms check and the two online platforms, patients are allowed to enter the clinic and are given a sticker like so, so that we can identify them within the clinic. The entire clinic, all exposed surfaces are swapped with 90% ethanol on an hourly basis. Now, I think this slide is quite important because the Northern Hemisphere is now entering the summer season. Air conditioning and ventilation are very important not to harbor, harbor viral isolates in droplets. We have adopted this system, although it was planned with no references because I simply could not find any. All five air conditioners in the clinic are kept on. 
with all ventilator shafts seen here in blue, all around the outer walls kept open, we have circulators here, here in strategic spots aimed at circulating the air, but definitely from within to the outside. So we are getting fresh air from the outside through the ventilation slits inside, and we pump this air out with these circulators. Now we hope to be removing droplets. I don't I have no scientific reference on whether this is working, but it certainly does give a peace of mind. And of course, this in terms of the economic costs because of the air conditioning and uh, the, the environmental impact on, on such uh, energy consumption is, of course, very bad. But I think this is the less of uh, all evils that uh, we can contemplate at this moment without, uh, without a vaccine. Now, I do wear goggles and a mask, but no head cover when I see my outpatients. And I suppose everything is the same for everyone. Well, thank you for sharing your time. I hope I could be of some help. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, interesting concept for your airflow. Mm -hmm. It always intrigued me on transatlantic flights. The pilot's air gets changed 10 times and the passenger's air only three times. So that's a wonderful system for recirculating anything that's on the aeroplane at the back. Um, have, has anybody analyzed your airflow to, to see if it is going in the direction that's hypothetical? Okay. <laughs> These circulators are actually quite strong. And you know when you walk yep. through them, they really do give out a punch. So I think we are doing something to the circulation, but of course we can't really quantify it. Sure. And uh, one last question from me. It, are the numbers picking up? I noticed the graph was beginning to pick up. Since then, is it continuing to pick up? Well, in terms of uh, refractive. In terms of refractive, uh, compared to last year, refractive procedures are on par. Uh, cataract, uh -huh. just catastrophic. <laughs> Dear. <laughs> Uh, other panel members, do you want to ask uh, David a quick question? Hi, David. Uh, I would like to know what is the comparison of your numbers in your clinic to the Korean-wide uh, numbers. Do you have any insights on that? Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, uh, the comparison of your numbers in your clinic versus the numbers uh, across Korea. Is it similar or are you performing better comparably? Or so to understand what can be the, the driver uh, for ones to recover faster than others in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, surgery and, and business wise? Right, I understand the question, but I think it's a matter of mass conscience. And if the public sees the numbers picking up, they're not going to come to any clinic especially for elective procedures. Now, I have heard that pediatricians, ENT doctors have suffered the most, while plastic surgeons, refractive surgeons were not hit that hard. It's very interesting. <laughs> now, yeah. talking to the entire nation, I can't be certain because that would almost be close to corporate espionage, but I do think that the numbers that are shown in my clinic does reflect uh, most of the clinics in South Korea. Okay, well, I think we can all congratulate uh, South Korea on the way in which you've coped with the disease. Uh, your numbers are really uh, excellent. Um, I only wish the United Kingdom had uh, managed the same, but uh, our numbers are disastrous, almost 40,000. Well, we, we are dead. getting newly sporadic cases, uh, uh, community-acquired cases, and schools have started, so we really do need to uh, be careful on that. Yes. Okay. 
Gonzalez, do you want one last question? I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Gonzalo, can you, 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 you can't be heard. You hear me? Maybe with this, without this, can you hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We in Spain, we compare uh, many times with South Korea because uh, our countries are similar in terms of population. One of the critics in our country in Spain is that the government didn't cancel the use of masks until recently. And I've seen from your slides that the, if we compare social distancing, uh, distancing with the use of masks, maybe the use of masks is more important because uh, I have seen that your numbers are very good and you deserve congratulations because of that. But maybe a social distancing, uh, distancing is, not, uh, is not possible in some circumstances. So I want you to, to give a reflection about, uh, to compare if really the use of masks is so effective even if social distancing uh, cannot be achieved. Okay, uh, I think we were lucky in this regard because we seasonally suffer from Chinese smog and dust uh, flying over the Yellow Sea into the Korean Peninsula every year. And the air in Seoul, and I know John's visited us, it's really not good. So the production of masks and their wearing by the general public isn't a very strange idea in Korea because the air is so bad and we already had these factories in place. Now most of the world did not have the manufacturing facilities available for quick manufacture of masks because they simply were not needed products before the pandemic. And I think that was one of the reasons why we could be providing the, the public with enough number of masks uh, to cover this pandemic. Now, uh, there have been no reported cases of COVID positive patients coming in from public transports. In which circumstances, as you so pointed out correctly, that we cannot be practicing social distancing, especially in the rush hour in uh, Seoul Metro. It's just not possible. And I did show a slide with everybody wearing masks coming out of the stations in rush hour. So I think, yes. Social distancing is very important, but also the wearing of masks in, w in which circumstances that uh, social distancing is not possible can also reflect uh, almost the same amount of protection against infection. Thank you, David. I think in, the, um, in order to conserve time, uh, we'd better pass on. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the masks or the Chinese pollution that uh, gave you your uh, protection. Let's hope it was the masks. Um, now our next uh, is John Chang. Uh, John, you're on. David, I apologize for the pollution. <laughs> Coming from China. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to share with you um the our the hong kong situation with the COVID 19 and i'm going to talk a little bit i'm sure you all, all know this but i'm just going to repeat a little bit and it's a good thing actually uh a way to kind of explain to your patients if you, you send them so you know through social media emails you can even educate your staff and have them educate their families and their friends and your relatives how important this mask wearing is so let me show you Okay. Okay. Can you see my slide and can you hear me? Yes. Yep. We can. We can. Perfect. Now, uh, up until yesterday, 26th of May, in Hong Kong, as you know, we have 7.4 million people. Confirmed cases, 1,066. Only four deaths. And now, at practically everybody is recovered. Only 36 are still in hospital. Now, we have the same population almost as New York. You can see the difference in the numbers between you know us and New York. And in mainland China, everything is back to normal now. People are flying all over the place, 
schools have resumed. Uh, essentially, in China, despite it came came from China, everything is like um, you know uh, uh, back to normal now. This is a slide um, that I'm going to show you from the beginning. Um, our first infected case was in the beginning of January, and if you look at the colors, the green, the sorry, the blue are the imported cases, and the red are our local cases. You can see the numbers. The number is very small for the and local cases. The red is very small, and we were doing very well. How we do well? Basically, everybody wore masks, social distancing, and we rubbed our hands with alcohol. Everything. Go to elevator. You know, we're just like pressing the buttons, and we alcohol rub our hands. We have door handles. We stay away from them. We open it with our hands. We alcohol rub again. So we did very well until around March, and suddenly there's a surge as students returned from the U.S. and from the U.K. So we've got this big blue, all this massive uh, 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 a rise in this um, epidemic because these students went out at, to bars and restaurants and they did not wear masks, okay? They did not wear masks and they spread it all over the place. And then took us a long time, quite a while, almost a month, actually really a month, for no more local cases. You can see there's no more red and the, even the imported cases are very restricted. And I'll show you how we've managed to do that. And right now, we've got about 12 days, I believe now, with zero local cases. Now, the importance of wearing surgical masks. In 2003, we had SARS. So when we heard about the COVID, we immediately, everybody, the residents, knew exactly what to do. 100% mask wearing and social behavior changes. Now, this is an important graph. You can show your staff and show, you send this to your patients. If you look at this, the, this is the incubation period, okay? Average incubation period is about five days and 97.5%. 11.5 day, day, after 11.5 days, they show symptoms. But remember, if they haven't, this, this is a problem with this virus, is that you don't show symptoms, but you are infected, okay? So in fact, the longest incubation period that was reported was 27 days. So this patient is walking around for 27 days, it's infecting everybody else, asymptomatic. He didn't even know he had the virus. And you can see how important it is to wear the mask because he will block his saliva, you know, uh, from reaching people, okay? And uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so you're contagious through the whole period and you're going out infecting everybody. Okay, so in fact, some infected individuals were asymptomatic throughout the entire period. So our restrictions, basically in Hong Kong, we completely shut down um, outside coming in. But as you see, we had some blue as well still because we're allowing Hong Kong residents to come in to Hong Kong. So all non-Hong Kong residents are not allowed to come in. Uh, Non-Hong Kong residents from mainland China, Macau and Taiwan will be denied entry if they've been to any overseas country in the past 14 days. If they've been staying in that from China, you know, from mainland, Macau, and Taiwan, and they've not been elsewhere, they are allowed to come in. But they have undergo compulsory quarantine at designated, either at home or hotels, actually, okay, and uh, for 14 days. And all asymptomatic, these are asymptomatic people, inbound travelers, and all asymptomatic inbound travelers arriving at the Hong Kong airport, it is mandatory that they have their deep throat saliva test and if they have a, if they, um, if they, it's like, if they come in late at night, what we do is we take the saliva and we put them in a hotel, okay, near the airport, and they are not out, allowed away from the our site until they test negative. And we also have this electronic wristband that they have to wear, and it's, it actually is attached uh, or connected to their cell phone. And what happens is the minute they leave their home, the cell phone will alert the health authorities that this person has left their home. And wearing this wristband is obviously compulsory. We've had a few people that snuck out for a meal and 
I guess it's also very, everybody was very cooperative. They immediately called the police. So they tracked them down very, very quickly. So this worked very well for the quarantine. Basically, also the police would do surprise visits to their homes to make sure the person is at home because they could take, somehow manage to take the wristband off and leave it at home. And we also, the health authority would call them randomly at their home to make sure they're at home. Anybody who's symptomatic comes to Hong Kong, goes immediately to the hospital. Uh, all, entertainment, all entertainment venues were initially closed at the peak. And then now the fitness centers, the beauty parlors, the massage cinemas, amusement centers are all back open now. Uh, but the sauna, the sauna rooms, party rooms, karaoke, and nightclubs are closed until tomorrow. So they will open as well, but they will still have a limit to the, uh, uh, what I have here, initially prohibited any group gathering of more than four persons, and now eight, eight persons. So anybody more than eight persons is not allowed in public. And schools and churches actually now reopened. In schools, they start off with the senior classes first and gradually with the more junior classes. The restaurant bars and pubs are open, but um, uh, uh, the tables are separated by 1.5 meters, like in Korea and also uh, in Mexico. Uh, we limit eight persons. It used to be four persons per table. Now we allow eight or less. They are only out, they have to take off their masks only when they're eating and drinking, and they have to sanitize their hand, alcohol actually, not povidone, I'm sorry, and temperature measurement before they enter. Uh, since as of May 26, we have not had a local case for 12 days. And the city is considered free of local transmission after two 14-day periods, that's 28 days of zero cases. So we're not far away. Uh, what about our hospital policy? We have no restrictions with local patients without travel history in the past 14 days. But if they are symptomatic, we do not let them book. Okay. And, but if they're asymptomatic, under quarantine, we will not let them come. Uh, asymptomatic patients with close contacts with confirmed cases or clusters that were infected, we will not let them make a booking. And when we limit two accompanying person per patient, so patients coming in can only have two more people accompanying them. When they come in at the booking, obviously through the phone, arrive at the front door, and when they sign in at the registration counter, we ask them three times, three times, the following questions. In the past 14 days, did you have any symptoms? Have you been traveling outside Hong Kong? Any of your family members have been traveling outside Hong Kong? Are you in close contact with confirmed cases? Or have your family members been in contact with confirmed cases? So I, as I said, also when they, uh, the, the, we ask them three times, but when they check in, we also give them a form, triage form to fill in with all the questions again and a bit more. Um, but it seems obsessive and compulsive doing this, asking these questions repeatedly, but it actually shows how we are very cautious and would actually impart a sense of security for our patients. What about staff? Well, our staff would have full PPE at the entrance. They have their temperature check and they ask to have the alcohol rub. If they come without a face mask, we will not, face mask, we'll, we'll not let them in. And we have a visit log of, visit log of everybody. Um, lunch, we, you can see we have a acrylic uh, uh, a sh uh, a shield um, separating partitions. Uh, we have separating the tables, uh, and then our staff has separate lunch hours, so they come in at different times rather than all pile in at the same time. Our clinic sessions were reduced, and as of next week, we're back in the full swing. The surgical sessions at our peak, when the uh, when the infection was at peak. We mostly arranged it at the morning, late morning or early afternoon. So that would reduce the manpower and also reduce the risk of staff infection. So we put them all kind of around the lunchtime. Uh, at the moment, our hospital clinic is about back to 70% volume before the infection. Our eye surgery, we have two, we have two sites, the hospital and an outside clinic. The outside clinic is in a, in a business district. Um, so the hospital connects 70 percent volume, the eye surgery had a cataract surgery and, and you know retina surgery back 70 percent volume volume. Our outside clinic in the business district, outpatients now back 80 percent. Our refractive surgery 
is 100%. In fact, as next week, I think we're actually more than before the COVID. So we're really doing quite well with effective surgery. And this might be due to three reasons why our volume has come back. Obviously, you know, our numbers are down now, but even, in fact, um, we never went down very much. At worst, we dropped about 30%, even at the peak of the infection. Uh, the younger patients uh, are not as concerned about the virus because they're less prone to death. Most patients are working from home even now, so they're able to have surgery without needing to take official time off. And everybody locked down, these are younger people, right? They're Zooming each other. So they're sharing their recent experience on their refractive surgery with their friends and relatives. And in fact, even before all this, every time after a vacation or a holiday, our volume go up because they go back, they meet their friends, they socialize, they talk about their refractive surgery, they go home with their family and they tell the family members about the, the refractive surgery. So the latest the refractive surgery volume actually never really went down. It went down about you know, 30% at its peak, but now it's like full recovery of not even better than before. So we never locked down like Korea. We're allowed to go to work, although home office is encouraged. Nearly 100% wear face masks when they go out. In fact, if you don't wear one, people will come and tell you off. There's frequent hand washing and this portable alcohol hand rub, very important. Uh, no handshaking, no hugging, no kissing. And each person have one pair of chopsticks for eating and another pair for picking up food. And most people were very good, you know, because of the SARS, they all stayed home after work. That was at its peak. Now everybody's out on the streets, but obviously they're all still wearing, wearing masks. So what about opportunities after shutdown? Um, this is one thing, you know, contact lenses are a source of infection. So a lot of people, in fact, our staff would change to wearing glasses and not wear contact lenses during the peak infection period. So we tell our patients, your laser vision correction is safer because contact lenses is a source of infection with a virus and, you know, not just a virus, even with bacteria, you know, from, you know, before. Now, smile, that was already mentioned, okay, with Dr. Graf. Um, you know, the smile, there's no virus flying everywhere in the surgery room. So some patients, if they're concerned about this, then we would do smile, okay? We'd offer them smile. Shrimp laser is very good because there's one function, you can step on the pedal first to start on the suction, wait a few sec sec seconds, and then you apply the eczema laser. So that way you would really significantly diminish the plume from going anywhere else. Although as Dr. Grove says already, there's no proof. In fact, there was a study where they, 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 they used la eczema laser and they fired on a, a culture plate with, uh, I think, exhaust virus, and they, they took the plume and did not find any virus. Uh, so, you know, but still, you know, it, it's, it's good that you have this feature, added safety, for yourself and for your patients. And then you can also send information, as I told you about the information about the uh, incubation period, how important it is to wear masks, you know, show that you're very concerned about this, you know, teaching patients why they should be wearing masks, okay? And this also prevent this in your own clinic. So in conclusion, social distancing and masks will slow transmission and prevent large outbreaks. It allows contact tracing and tests to keep up. Wearing a mask not only uh, protects, it also decreases the dosage of virus. So even if you get infected and you have a small dose, it will allow, allow enough time for your body to build antibodies to fight the virus. If you don't have a mask, you get a full dose. Your, do your infections are much more serious. Surgeons should pay more attention to er earlier reopening or the refractive surgery center rather than the cataract surgery center. And one thing is uh, consider checking your stock of frequently used items. We actually ran out of riboflavin for our LASIK extra. So, uh, you know, we're in a little bit of trouble in terms of LASIK extra. We've had to kind of be very, uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, we have to wait actually for the stock. So we kind of changed some of our uh, appointments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John.
Um, very impressive, uh, as uh, always. Uh, interesting that uh, you had an influx after the return of um, students um, and uh, managed to cope with it. Um, now, we're, we, I'm sorry, but we are a little bit running over time now. So what I would like to do is to ask uh, Jerry Tan to give his presentation. And we, we had time for discussion at the end, but clearly we need to get uh, the uh, speakers in. Oh, Jerry's going to give uh, a, a very sterile talk now. Um, <laughs> Jerry? Can you hear me? Yes, Can you yes. Not hear me? <laughs> Just, I, I, I had to wear a mask because if you don't, hold on a second. If you have a talk on COVID-19 pandemic and you don't wear a mask, that's sacrilege. Okay. I'm in my room alone. So I'm just, I'm just playing a fool a little bit. So I, all of you can see my slide. And what happens is that I'm going to give you a refractive surgeon's perspective in Singapore. Because what happens is that uh, John and David have got done such a good job. Most of the things we are doing is uh, identical. So I'm going to skip over a few things and tell you what's happening in Singapore. Plus, then I'm going to give you what I've been doing at this period of time. And in Singapore, we are in a tougher situation because the government is a lot stricter. So um, let's go through this now. Now, what happens is that um, what's the shutdown policy in Singapore? Well, in the first wave, we got our cases coming from Wuhan and we went through it li literally unscathed. All we did was a lot of contact tracing and we shut down a lot of infections very quickly. So unfortunately, we got overconfident. And just like John said, in the second wave, the students returned from Europe, especially London and uh, France and Italy and also the workers. And almost everyone we tested on returning was infected. In fact, we had an ophthalmologist from the Singapore National Eye Center that brought his uh, daughter home, I think, from um, UK after her exams. And he was the first ophthalmologist to be infected. Uh, he, in fact, he was an infectious disease specialist of the cornea. So we were joking and said that, you know, had to be the first one to get infection. Anyway, he's now well after being quarantined and he's doing great. We had uh, two ophthalmologists and one medical officer from one of the major hospitals that uh, became infected with COVID virus. So it's not something to laugh about. Uh, they've got infection from their patients. And uh, uh, I think ophthalmologists are at a slightly higher risk. Um, unfortunately, people who came back were just like John's patients. They are not really generally socially responsible. Uh, when they returned to Singapore, they, before they returned home to stay home, they went to visit their girlfriend. They went to go to uh, Bak Kut Teh, which is a pork, pork rib stall to eat first because they'd been away from Singapore for such a long time before going home to be in quarantine. So you can just imagine, you know, that all these people are doing this kind of thing. So unfortunately, people are not very responsible. Uh, let's see now. Why is my slide not moving? Ah, here. Uh, unfortunately, Singapore had one thing different from the countries like South Korea and Hong Kong. We had a large group of what we call foreign workers. Usually they were from India and they come to Singapore to help us with our construction work. And there were about 350,000 workers in dormitories. And it was a disaster waiting to happen. So basically in the second wave, some of these workers got infected and it shot our rate of um, cases up tremendously. We were getting almost a, a thousand cases a day, but it's finally flattening down. You can see the curve coming downward. And fortunately, 
we have had only about 32,000 as of today uh, cases. But one thing I must say, the medical care in Singapore is really good. And out of about 32,000 cases, we've only had 23 deaths, which means we have a death rate of 0.072%. Refractive surgery, easy answer. We are not allowed to do any refractive surgery. Cataract surgery is not allowed as an elective procedure. You only can do phacomorphic, phacolytic uh, lens extractions. You can only do emergencies. And from a very full clinic, I see about maybe a quarter of what I used to see every day. Mostly emergencies like uh, uh, flashes and floaters and where there, there's a risk of retinal detachment, retinal tears, bleeding in the eye, etc., etc. So no refractive surgery yet. So my talk is going to be a little bit different. From the very beginning, in January, we straight away started to do screening. That's my screening station. That's my, my head nurse there. She's all gloved up, wears the PPEs, and all she does is take all kinds of uh, data from the patients. We now do it electronically. What we've added to the slit lamp, I'm holding a plastic sheet that slides between the slit lamp, the front of the slit lamp, and the eyepieces. You can hardly see it. In fact, sometimes I don't even see it myself and I keep on crashing into it with my hands. But it's very unobstructive. In other words, the patients don't notice. You can talk to them and it's an entire sheet. In fact, after the COVID virus uh, pandemic is over, I will probably leave it there because it's not causing any problems for me. I had to hold it with my hands just to show you the size. You can actually see it. On screen here, you can actually see the size there, all the way down there. And it's a huge screen, but it doesn't seem to get in the way. So I'm going to keep it. Now, something that all of you should, uh, um, how do you say, pick up, is the use of UV light. It's cheap, it's good, and it's quick. This is using UVC light. UVC light is uh, sold uh, very cheaply as a fluorescent tube without any coating. It's totally transparent. You cannot stay in the room with it on. You will end up with eye, and it sterilizes the room very, very quickly, both by UVC light as well as by generation of freon gas. So uh, basically what happens, it literally kills the whole room. And what I do is I go from alternate rooms. So I have two consultation rooms. So I I see a patient in one room. After I finish seeing the patient, I go to the next room. The nurses switch on the UV light. They are very happy. They don't have to wipe down the whole room with alcohol. And after a while, they get callous and they miss this and they miss that. And you can damage your Humphrey visual field by using alcohol inside the bowl. So I have UVC lights all over the clinic. Every time it's lunchtime, my whole clinic is lit up blue in color. A real groovy color, like a disco. Uh, between patients, the light is on in my examination rooms, in my investigation rooms. I have all these UVC lights all set up. They're, they're cheap and they're quick and easy to use. Just don't stand in the room when you're, they're switched on. Now, what opportunities for laser vision correction after the pandemic? Basically, it's going to be euphoria. This is a picture from World War II or after World War II. So I expect the business to rise tremendously. It, so what actions do I recommend to speed up market recovery? Number one, you must provide them a safe environment. Telemedicine, I do it for free. Uh, I remain in communication with all my patients. And I've actually got new patients from all over the world. Uh, so that's very interesting. Many of them are from China. They are looking for people to cure their uh, refractive surgery problems. So it's nice to communicate with them. Uh, for Shun, I think you need to bring out a lot of new products to create excitement in the market when the euphoria comes, both for the eczema laser and for lenticular extraction. For the rest of the doctors I talked to, don't start a price war. Every time you start a price war, everybody gets hurt. 
And finally, you educate patients online because now you have, I, at least I have the time to do things I've never done before. Uh, we have the strictest advertising guidelines in Singapore. No testimonials, no best, no famous. We have to give information, which is not advertising. So I'm concentrating on patient education videos. What I've discovered looking through YouTube and the internet, it's easier to produce videos than you think because of all the YouTubers and the people on TikTok and the people who are doing Facebook and Insta videos, things have become a lot easier and a lot more professional looking. The cost is also really not prohib prohibitively expensive. You can do it all for less than a thousand US dollars. Let me give you an example. Now, this is a video my in-house team created. It's a kind of a fun video. Scene train, take three. The Shrin company is the best laser company in the world. It has the Amaris 1050 RS and it also has the best team of staff. Now you know what I do during the circuit breaker period which is also known as the lockdown period in Singapore. <laughs> what happens is that we've been playing around with uh, how to make things look professional. And I did this all with my own uh, team members, basically two people in my clinic. And it's kind of fun to do all these videos. Um, what happens is that the, the slowness of the video is because of the transmission speed. This is what it looks like in one of my consultation rooms. It's uh, basically one, one lamp on the side here, on the right-hand side, one reflector on the left-hand side, and one cameraman, and that's it. Basically, that's all you need uh, with a microphone, of course. So a lot of things are a lot easier to do. Now, it also, the pandemic also gave me a lot of time to do education videos, but uh, some things I had always wanted to do. So this is one of my creations, an artificial flower arrangement, which I, I created. And I thank everyone very much for listening to my talk. I hope you learned a little bit from me. Uh, I decided to make my talk a little bit more fun and lighthearted as well as uh, maybe something to pick up from is the use of UVC light. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Uh, we we are running short of time, so I'm I'm hoping we're going to get some questions at the end. I think your advertising no is excellent. It's a long time. You know, we really need evidence, not eminence. So I think the best is uh, out now and it's uh, just what is the evidence just one comment on your uv um uvc is uh quite an interesting device for sterilization but uh you need to look at um the radiance that lamps produce yes. uh, obviously it's an square law and the further you are away from the source the less your your dosage all right uh, but i'm sure this is going to be up at the end. Um, I, can we have Rohit to give his presentation? Um, and I'm sorry that um, they blamed a uh, spread of infection on the UK, Rohit, and now they're also blaming it on India. So uh, you and I are in it together, as usual. Uh, thank you, Professor Marshall and uh, the Schwinn team. And uh, see, I would uh, like to start off these questions, but I would not repeat most of those uh, processes which has already been discussed. I think we, have, we also follow the same process, but uh, the shutdown of policy in the country, we are, I think, going on the peak. So uh, at this point of time, some places where I come from is uh, relatively better, little better. So fortunately, we are just in the phase of where we are opening up. Uh, many places, 90% of the places in the country are not being allowed to do any treatment. But where I come from, it's a little better. I come from Bangalore, south of India. So we are allowed for elective surgeries. Uh, what will change in your practice? Uh, I think there are a few things which I'm going to show in my presentations. 
and uh, opportunities. So I think every country has a different way of looking at it. I did see some changes in how Singapore and Hong Kong is trying to uh, educate their population. Of course, contact lens is one of the major things uh, which we probably uh, patient don't want to wear contact lens dry eye because people are working from home. So what I did was uh, I st I take this presentation from a a uh, small point with Professor Marshall mentioned, uh, we need more of evidence than eminence-based uh, process. The, one of the major challenges for any refractive surgeon is the worry of aerosols. So we thought uh, we should do some work on aerosols and uh, work towards uh, seeing if it's actually the reason why we are worried about cataract or refractive surgery. But today I'm just going to stick to my experiment on uh, this, on the, just the refractive surgery at this point of time. No financial interest, since this is just proof of what is happening in your uh, in your OT. So we did the first part of an experiment. Uh, we used the microkeratome. We used uh, uh, the uh, PRK. We used the uh, smile, and we also used the femtosecond lasers. We put white ports uh, at different distances. We used the drop of uh, 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 the, the dye on the surface so that when you do a microkeratome, whenever wherever you have the aerosol or droplet space, it would all fall in different papers, white papers at different zones. So this was a simple experiment. This was a part one of the experiment. And uh, you can see that during this process of thing, you can see that these boards and you can see that wherever it's splash, wherever you have droplets or even some small aerosols, uh, they would all splash all over. And we found that this is the kind of splash. You can go up to around 10 to 15 inches uh, when you're doing a microkeratome. And uh, you can see your glove at the end of the day, how much of splash you have. So all this gave an idea of what we had to do in your process. Probably change your glove for every eye if you're doing a microkeratome. Be very careful about where it's going to hit you because it's going to smear all your uh, putty gowns. So it's best to change it your gloves and you know this you need probably a very big drape around the patient not a small drape because it can go really up to the patient chest when you are actually doing this procedure we did the same experiment with uh, the smile and uh, the femtosecond laser and the schwinn trans prk there was absolutely very very little and uh, this is done on a different microkeratome and uh, and what we try to do is, I, this photo is not very clear, but we try to keep ourselves away from, you keep your hand as social distance from the patient. When you're doing, extend your arm as much as possible. Keep your uh, foot pedal away from the, just under the patient, because all the aerosols would fall on this. And we went to the second level of experiment. We used a uh, very high resolution camera. This is something which can pick up your uh, your uh, aerosols, the smaller ones like 10, 20, 30 microns, and you are looking at 20,000 uh, frames per second. And your commercial DSLR and all your phones, sometimes the best phones today is around 900, and the DSLR cameras go around 250, 160 to 100. So you can imagine the amount of uh, ability to pick up. So what we, this is as uh, a setup, and this is the this is where you used your. Uh, you don't know um, the globe and uh, you started doing the same experiment and this is called the shadowography and you can see those uh, these droplets which are sometimes a uh, completely uns yes we're trying to look at computational modeling using your airflow how much of these aerosols and where do they actually splash in your ot this is a very important experiment because it tells you where to clean after you your places because some of the bigger ones would just fall down the some of the smaller one would go all around and this this is something which we submitted to jrs today this paper and the computation modeling will be submitted this next week which will give a clear idea of how much it happens and one of the things we did now is uh, using a 0.25 percent beaded in uh, 10 to 12 minutes because 0.25 percent beaded in in many papers we you we dilute it with the lubricant uh, within uh, uh, with a preservative free lubricant and this can be used and this cleans up and we don't have to worry about any uh, any residual uh, inflammation so we did the same experiment like I mentioned with smile PRK and uh, and the femto, we did not see any amount of aerosols at all. So probably at this point of time, microkeratome seems 
be a little bit of an issue and you can take a lot of precautions and probably do it and i have a complete video on uh, which is here this is something if you want to look at the complete video you can go and look into this but uh, the aerosol based uh, computation modeling i'll post it sometime this week i thank uh, the schwinn team and uh, professor marshall for giving me this opportunity Thank you, Rohit. <clears throat> Absolutely excellent uh, presentation as to how we should all be collecting uh, meaningful uh, data. I'm sorry I'm going to have to pass on because we've got three more presentations and hopefully a little bit of time for discussion at the end. But congratulations, that was a really useful study and I hope people will follow up and look at the video. Okay, well now we're going to Poland. Um, and I hope our next speaker is ready. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, I hate to say this, but you were all supposed to have uh, around five minutes. So I hope you can keep within the time frame for the last two speakers. Okay. I, <clears throat> Thank you. I will do my best. Thank you very much for introduction. So I would like to welcome you from uh, Poland, uh, exactly from Bydgoszcz. Uh, the city is uh, almost in the middle of Poland, and Poland is, uh, as you see, in geographical center of, of Europe. Uh, we were quite lucky because our first case was noted on March the 4th, so it was almost a month uh, later uh, than in Italy, for example. So it uh, gives us enough time to first of all, feel scared, and secondly, to prepare for, for, for the epidemic. So lockdown type control measures started quite early, a couple of days after the first case, and they were quite strong. The restrictions were quite strong for uh, almost over a month, almost for April, uh, we were uh, stuck at home. And it resulted uh, that they managed to suppress the initial phase of, of the epidemic. If you compare Poland and Italy, you can see that the curve is uh, rising quite slowly. But we reached uh, reach a plateau, a stabilization uh, around uh, 300 cases, uh, new cases a day, whereas in Italy uh, it was in, in thousands. Uh, Unfortunately, the curve is almost flat uh, for, for, uh, for uh, or has been flat for uh, two months. So we cannot, don't know what to expect. Is the peak ahead of us or we are going to, um, to stop the pandemic? And of, uh, in terms of uh, mortality rate, it's also quite good. Uh, we have 10 to 20 cases uh, a day which for Europe is, is still reasonably good uh, result. And if you look at total cases per million, in Spain you have like 4,000, USA 5,000, Italy, UK around 4,000. Uh, in Germany, uh, again, uh, it's about 2,000. And in Poland, it's still uh, only above uh, 500 cases. Uh, so we think this uh, strong uh, restrictions introduced very early have some some impact on, on the epidemic development in our country. Uh, and it allowed uh, the government to uh, ease off the restrictions uh, starting from uh, the middle of May. Uh, for example, some kindergartens were open, uh, hairdresser, uh, by the way, I'm still on the waiting list for, for my hairdresser. But cosmetic services uh, were also opened on uh, May the, the 16th. And during this whole April, uh, elective surgeries and plant surgeries, even cataract plant surgeries, were not allowed uh, to be performed. And uh, in our clinic, we can found uh, four stages. Uh, so we started to slow down our activities uh, in the middle of March. But we always all tell that we are still open. We are always admitting uh, urgent uh, cases. Uh, at the end of March, we stopped new appointments. We rescheduled majority of appointments and just on, admitted only uh, only urgent cases. Uh, but 
At the beginning of May, we start our new new normal, start admitting more patients, and in the middle of May, we performed first uh, laser, laser vision uh, correction surgeries. So April was a lost month uh, for income, uh, but not for marketing. So we tried to be to stay close uh, to our patients and referring doctors. We adjusted uh, procedures, and we take advantage uh, of the communication slowdown uh, of competitors. Uh, we improved our website uh, and updated our website content. We introduced teleservices. Uh, we were very active in, in social media, providing um, useful information for patients. Uh, also, the epidemic uh, gives, a, gives an opportunity to increase presence in the media at low cost. So we published some posts on main Polish uh, portals, uh, mainly on ice problems uh, during the epidemic. We performed uh, and uh, take uh, uh, part in a number of webinars. And we were also one of the first to produce this, uh, protective shields, uh, Jeritan showed you already. Probably every one of us is uh, using them now. Uh, but nevertheless, after the a couple of days after the first, the first case, we sent 200 shields to our referring doctors, and we were the first to do this. And as I said, uh, from the beginning of May, we start the new normal, introducing a number of uh, protection uh, and safety procedures, uh, including appointments, personal um, uh, equipment, uh, also, during the surgeries, uh, the majority of them were all dimensioned. I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, and we also put a stress on website content, and we are trying to inform our patients that uh, such protective measures were introduced uh, to feel our patients more safe. And for the moment, uh, how we see the future, we are moderately optimistic about the future. We were also it was mentioned before that we were quite surprised that patients are more interested in laser vision correction than that uh, than we expected and patients are more uh, spontaneously recommending us in social media maybe it is the way of supporting doctors but probably they just have uh, more time so we think more time patients have definitely more time to think about the surgery, to, to recover after the surgery. Probably they have, for sure, they will have less money. So we decided to keep the prices at the same level, but enhance uh, the possibility of payment by installment. It should be also mentioned that the hospital is run by doctors, so we have relatively low administration costs. Uh, and uh, we were given a substantial compensation from the government for a lockdown, providing we maintain the employment rate for the next uh, six months. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry we're going to have to pass straight on to the next speaker, Gonzalo Spain. Uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time, but we are running very short of time. <coughs> Gonzalo? Okay. I, I, I go through the, all the aspects that have been mentioned by the previous speakers so brilliantly. So I'll go directly to uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, this is the situation in Spain. We have had the terrible uh, uh, nearly um, uh, around three hundred thousand cases, twenty-seven people who have died. Officially, maybe the real numbers uh, are around 40,000 people. Uh, we still have a very uh, large number of active cases. But the problem in my country is that the economical impact of the, uh, of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Spain has a high rate of unemployed, unemployment. Uh, our rate before the crisis uh, when employment was around 40, 14% in all the country. As you can see here, these are the different parts of Spain. But the, the global number is around 
was around 14. After the crisis, after the crisis it's estimated that the unemployment rate will be increased by 8%, which means that nearly 4 million people of a country of 47 million people will be unemployed. So we're going to have big economic problems if we don't start. Well, I am the medical director of Clinica Baviera. Uh, we have uh, this group of uh, 86 clinics in, in Europe, both in Spain, also in Germany, in Austria, and Italy. Most of them are, have their surgical facilities, and we stop completely stop uh, by the mean March. We stop in April, and we started to do again a clinic as well as surgery from the beginning of May. Okay, to try to answer the question very quickly. Actions to speed up market recovery. To make things easier for the patient. We have to make easy, uh, quick and easy, or super easy for the patients. If we want to have laser vision correction uh, in the healthy situation. We need to make easier payments. I don't mean we have to put the prices down, but we have to do installments or financial help. We have to give better uh, agendas for the patient. We have to try to have less waiting time, more options for surgery. We have to do, uh, if possible, these techniques. Uh, we have uh, less pain and quick recovery. And we have to use the telemedicine in follow-up to try to make things easier. We have to gain patient confidence through honest, honest information. It is very important to be honest always, but especially when we have this crisis time. And we have to make people appreciate the impact that uh, laser vision correction is going to provide the quality of life. Second, opportunities for laser vision correction after, and I would say better during the pandemic. Uh, this is a sentence from Julio Baviera, who is uh, one of the founders of the clinic and the former medical director. He says that masks and glasses do not live together well. This is really a fact, because to live with masks and glasses is not easy. If you look at the internet, you will find a lot of videos telling you how to deal with foggy glasses, how to wear a face mask without fogging up, and so. So the logical answer is, if you don't want to have foggy in your glasses, avoid the glasses, get rid of your glasses. So this is a good time for refractive surgery. The third question, obstacles limiting market penetrance of laser vision correction during the pandemic. We find three obstacles to laser vision correction. One is always the, the price. So I don't mean in Spain we have very competitive prices. I don't mean we have to put them down, but we have to make things easier by financial facilities, health, installments for the patients. The second obstacle is the fear that the patient has to pain. And the third one is the misinformation. So we should stay more connected with our patients. We have to be available at all time, uh, both physical or telematic. We have to be uh, careful with them in the emergencies. We have to give appointments, reports if they need. I mean, we have to give information so that the, uh, this misinformation and the fear to pain uh, will be, uh, will be uh, overtaken. We should make laser vision correction experience very simple, as simple as patient, in terms of information, indication, techniques, instructions, follow-up, and reports. And the last thing, what to expect from the industry, very easy. We have to, to work with the industry. We have to do teamwork. The industry has to do teamwork with the ophthalmologists to provide real information of those market options that are really more cost effective for the patients. Just want to finish thanking all the, all the medical staff, all the workers who have been fighting so much to put down the slope of the coronavirus uh, curve, which was really very, very terrible during the April, and uh, thanks God it's coming better and better. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, 
we pass on to uh, my uh, fellow countryman, Alan. Do, Alan, do, do you think you can uh, present before our cutoff? I'm sorry I'm about the uh, delay. Thank you very much, John, and, um, and to Shwin for inviting me to to talk. Um, in the UK, the um, the healthcare system is really split between the National Health Service as a kind of government um, funded and run institution, which does the majority of um, of healthcare, especially for things like cataracts and and other eye disease, um, and approximately eighty to ninety percent of all healthcare in the UK uh, is carried out there. And then the private sector, which is where all, all of refractive surgery um, takes place, is um, is separate. The the situation in the UK was um, total lockdown from the end of March, um, and into the into May there have been an easing of restrictions, um, and there is now more of a focus on how we will restart um, services. Certainly, from the point of view from the point of view of government hospital. Uh, and the National Health Service, um, it's immensely challenging because waiting times uh, for surgery prior to COVID were were long, um, you know, because it's state funded. So it was it was typical to wait two, three, sometimes even four months from when you were referred to when you may have surgery. Um, and then with three months of total cessation of all elective care, um, and now resumption is advised to be at about 50% volume. So cataract lists rather than being maybe eight eyes in the morning or an afternoon would be down to four. Um, you know, it's a, it's a matter of opinion, but I personally don't think that the NHS or the National Health Service in the UK will recover from this um, because the waiting list will be insurmountably large. Um, so solutions you know, may need to be sought uh, in the private sector because we're limited by the number of doctors and number of nurses. Um, the, the, this talk will focus more on refractive surgery because it's what we're what we're about here, um, and so we'll be focusing more on what we're doing in the in the private sector and in my own uh, private um, facility to to plan restarting restarting services. So you know this has been mentioned, but I think it's it's important now. There is um, there is a focus on what is considered uh, essential. You know we're still in a kind of easing of restrictions. Uh, in the UK, and you know, prior to COVID, I would always I would always remind uh, people that I was speaking to about uh, laser vision correction or refractive surgery that it is not cosmetic surgery. Um, you know, patients have a risk of contact lens related infection. They have quality of vision issues that can impact on their ability to function. And now, as it has been mentioned, the combination of mask wearing and glasses is a is a significant problem. Um, we opened our our clinic last week. Um, and we're seeing people already complaining of this problem uh, and coming back looking for looking for solutions. Um, we, I did my first list last week, um, and the patients that I treated with laser vision correction technology um, included a young firefighter who required unaided uh, vision in order to be able to work and do his job, which is obviously an essential emergency job. Um, I treated an ITU physician who was con totally contact lens intolerant um, and her glasses would fog up under all of her PPE um, equipment. So again, it was uh, a totally essential um, requirement for her to be able to do, do this important element of her job. And then, you know, we have patients with corneal blindness. So I had a patient with bilateral corneal blindness due to regular scarring and we treated with laser uh, PTK. And so there are many applications of uh, laser, be it refractive or in the treatment of corneal disease, which even in the context of uh, COVID and the pandemic are still essential. Um, clearly, as we move out of, uh, as we move into an easing of restrictions and into more um, new normal uh, activity, we will have patients uh, coming back that just don't, you know, don't want to wear glasses and contact lenses. But it's important to remember that really the the necessity for wearing uh, glasses uh, can totally prevent people doing their, their essential jobs. What did we do during lockdown? Well, we, we used the time to uh, revise our website. Um, and I think it's important to remember that patients don't know what is happening in, uh, in your clinic or what is not happening in your clinic. So we had a, a message that is updated in real time um, relating to COVID-19. And I think we will keep this on here for the foreseeable future. And patients can then click through uh, to find out more about all of the measures that we have in place uh, to try and reduce 
the risk of transmission. And you've heard from many speakers um, the things that are doing, uh, people are doing. And there's really no different in terms of what, what's happening in our clinic. Um, we one exception being is that we have a high risk um, pathway for people that consider themselves to be high risk, people that have um, reduced vision due to bilateral cataract, for example. And those patients can, in theory, um, only come into the clinic at times when other patients are there at the time of their surgery. So they can come and have a consultation. Uh, they can come and have they can have telemedicine consultation. They can have all their diagnostics done out of hours. They can be called in from the car waiting outside the clinic um, on, at the time of surgery, kept in a room separate from all other patients. And we've had patients come through in this way who never see another patient at any time point and are able to have their cataract surgery done in this way. And the same would be true also of refractive surgery if, if those con patients consider themselves to be high risk. But as we know, in general, refractive surgery is younger patients who are normally not, not at such high risk of the disease. Um, we have introduced video consultations. Um, again, everything's available online so patients know what we're doing to, to increase uh, safety and reduce the risk of transmission. We have these uh, branded floor stickers here so patients can space themselves two meters apart uh, in the clinic. We've reduced chairs. We've used some of the uh, consult rooms. We have reapportioned into sub waiting areas so we, we have a flow in the clinic that moves patients around. Um, so they don't come into contact with other patients or we limit the contact with other patients. We've increased appointment times, we've increased surgical times, and all of this helps to um, reduce contact between patients. It's reassuring for them, reassuring for our staff. Um, and we have, again, an air filtration system and an air conditioning system. And, what, and now we've had the most amazing summer in the UK. Um, we, we can also open windows, which creates more of a uh, circulation of air we have a station when patients arrive. We, we provide them with uh, branded, small, personalized hand gels, and they have a main hand gel. Uh, we, we want them to wash their hands as well. We give them a face mask, and there's screening that happens before they get to clinic um, to ensure that there is, there's no symptoms or contact with anyone uh, that has symptoms. And then I think it's important to show patients what their experience will be. Um, so we've done some of these videos that give them uh, to play. An idea of their experience coming into the clinic. It gives them an idea of the space, of the PPE that staff are wearing. Um, we have an elevator and stairs, which means we can have one flow for patients going up the building or down the building, and another flow for patients going the other way. We have 19 rooms, and so it gives us some opportunity, many opportunities for separating patients. Um, and again, we show this to patients because now clinics will have to. Um, reassure patients not only about the procedure but also about things that they're doing to improve uh, safety when it comes to uh, COVID-19 and coronavirus. Um, and, I th and I think this kind of uh, video is reassuring for patients to see. We're, we're totally paperless so we don't have patients using pens or paper for consent, for registration forms, for screening forms, um, likewise for doctors recording things and diagnostics. Everything is done totally electronic. Um, and then we hope that once the restrictions are fully eased, this will be the response of patients who want to come and see us in our clinic. But there will be a, uh, a rush back to uh, back to seek our services. And I think we'll be doing questions at the end, but uh, hopefully I kept with my time there, John. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for your attention and for the invitation to speak. Thank you very much for presentation um, and uh, I think everybody's trying to cope with these incredibly difficult service um, problems that we're all confused with. Uh, Mars and miss I think is a really quite interesting uh, excuse to get rid of your spectacles. Um, uh, now I wonder um, Thomas do we have a little time, or what is the guillotining effect of this yes, uh, the, time base? The plan, the plan is that we have another 15 to 20 minutes for a discussion, and there are already okay. some questions coming up from the from different users and doctors. Yep. So one question. Okay. Yeah. Um, John Marie, uh, do you have a question in your mind for the auditorium, for the speakers, before we start to share the questions from the auditorium? 
I have a comment to make. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just um, you, as you saw, Dr. Shetty showed how much all this stuff can be sprayed around. And what happened in the earlier days when we had SARS, we had a lot of doctors, they got very affected. And the reason they didn't know how to remove their, their protective wear. So, you know, nowadays with the COVID, when they come out of the intensive care, it takes them one hour to remove their protective wear. wear. So for us, as you can see, when you're doing microcaratome, everything's sprayed all over the place. So when you remove your surgical wear, you take the mask off, don't touch the front, and you fold it, okay? And then your all your clothes, you fold it, don't touch the, the front. The, otherwise, you know, you touch it and then you touch your face. There's no use wearing those PPEs. So I, I think this is very important for us to be aware of this. You know, when I go home with a mask, I take it off, I turn it, you know, inside out and I tie it and I throw it. And another thing is all our surgical wear, when we're done with it, is thrown into a closed bin. Okay, so the, the bin is covered. So, you know, there is not going to open bin where it's going to spread all over the place. So I think this is very important that you need to be aware that not only you're protecting yourself, when you remove your protection, you need to be very aware of how to take everything off. Can I, can I add a one point to what Dr. John said? Yes. So basically, what we do, we have a protocol. We are all, as surgeons, we're used to taking off the glove and throwing it. Now, what I do is I use betadine on my 10% betadine on my glove or alcohol and wait for at least five minutes and then I take it off. And everything, for example, use a laser cone or use a, a blade. Yep. We all try to discard it to the bin. Now, what we do is we have a holding tray which has uh, sodium hypochlorite. So whatever we normally discard, the cones, blade, even the smile or a LASIK or whatever, I dip it into it, wait for 10 minutes, and then it goes to the disposable bag. So what happens is it, it has that whatever, if there is a source of any virus, you automatically kill it before you discard it. That's right. That's uh, very good advice. Uh, any other questions from the panel? Yes, there was a question. If you are using microkeratons, how do you minimize these aerosols? I think in some countries they recommended the use of HPMC. So what is your overall uh, opinion? This was a question from Shishi Sakharia. So uh, regarding this HPMC, any comment on that with this metacetyl cellulose, with this uh, special one? We tried, uh, we tried this experiment, which I'm just, which I just showed, with HPMC. The splash is exactly the same as you don't put it. So, I mean, uh, so I don't, I, we did not see a difference when you, when you use or not use the HPMC. You're worried about aerosols here, but one thing which really helped us to, uh, to be very safe is use of 0.25 percent beaded in, uh, or 0.10 to 1.25 percent beaded in in diluted in a non-preservative uh, preservative free drops which kills the COVID and you wash it off after 10 minutes so you are much safer there yeah the the this uh, Matthew cellulose there was a video actually um i don't remember who did it from england uh, it's very nice he showed while he was doing the faco the spray was all over the place so but he also showed that if you drop this Matthew cellulose onto the cornea it will prevent all that spray going all over the place. And also the smaller incisions, the tighter wounds, actually have less spray. So that, that was a very nice video. So I think for cataract surgery, um, if you drop it in every minute uh, on HPMC, you'll actually stop the spray in cataract surgery from going all over the place. But I don't, I think Mycocurtum, instead of using BSS to lubricate it, use HPMC. I wonder if that would affect the, uh, 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 ability to cut. I, I wouldn't, I have not tried that. So, but for cataract surgery, yes. Thank you. Rohit, yes, Rohit do, you, do, you, do, you, do you wish to make further comment on that? I we tried that, uh, Dr. Chan, I remember that uh, video from Bristol. There's one mm. small flaw in that video. 
if you see mm-hmm. his fake out tip he has kept a fake out tip at the incision mm-hmm. and we tried like, doing the same experiment with the high speed camera what i just showed which looks at aerosol when you go inside like how all your cataract surgeons do so beautifully you hardly get any aerosols if you bring it up if you look at his video his his fake out tip is at the incision and nobody does a fake out at the incision so you will get a splash so i'm going to send you that link of that video we did and you will see that when you recreate an experiment like way he did it looks scary but when you do your peco like all of you do the normal way there is no aerosol yes yeah yeah the thing Thank is you. that the the viral load is so low uh, when you even if you don't use uh, povidone jolain but if you use povidone jolain it's so low that we don't have to worry uh, about the aerosol and and also during phagomorphification because uh, if you aspirate the content of the entire chamber for 3 4 seconds you will uh, aspirate and you replace it with the bss so there's no no uh, no role for uh, aerosol aerosol selection and um, for microkeratome uh, the use of covid on your line i think that in this situation should be mandatory Can can I just make a comment there was a comment earlier about the um the laser plume with eczema um we did a lot of work in the late 70s early 80s uh and uh, there was uh, this work was submitted to the FDA along with some stuff from Carmen Puliafita which showed that um at 193 the uh, irradiance was sufficient that it it did fracture uh, all the particles coming off so there was no real danger from the plume in terms of eczema laser surgery i think that is is really safe it's a different issue with um, infrared and the femto but certainly with the eczema um, that's a sterile uh, zone over the wound This, this is only one paper which talks about they used the polio wax polio virus on the surface and they did the laser and they were able to find a live polio surviving this uh, plume so that's the only paper which you which says which gives us a warning about the laser plumes at this point of time yeah yeah but i think people forget literature that's more than 20 years old <laughs> So there is okay, one Thomas, There is one question Sorry. from the from the audience uh, what would be your recommended policy for sterilization between patients Okay who'd like to answer that sterilization between patients We use um we every every pack is sterilized for every patient and we try to use disposable uh things as much as we can um that's how we do it but we don't sterilize in between so all our equipment is pre-sterilized so each patient gets a new pack is completely sterilized yeah well that's clear but i think the question was more about the 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 patient table all the things that are more or less belonging to the room and the still in contact with both the patients the outgoing and the incoming patient Yeah, well the the as john says you know the uv the is it's uv light treatment for the eczema laser so you know whatever gets gets sprayed out basically should be sterilized already and we use also polydon iodine before they come in uh, uh a drop in the eye and also around the eyelids so that that should in theory kill the virus It would, have, thing, would have been interesting. It would have been interesting to see the infection rates of Fyodorov's carousel procedure. You remember that? <laughs> We don't have any data on that. Uh, if I may add, John. Um, yes. Yeah. Practice with, with practices in Hong Kong and South Korea, I think. have shown that we do not we did not find any sporadic uh patients in our clinics and we John Chang's in my clinic are 
definitely not small volume clinics. And the practice yeah. that we're managing now, I think, is uh, speaks for itself in that uh, it is working against COVID-19. Well, maybe a symptomatic patient has, or an asymptomatic patient has not visited us, or he may have, he or she may have. But what we're doing now says it works. And I would also like to stress the fact uh, the word aerosol traditionally means and uh, involves the respiratory tract, saliva, and something out of the nose. And we shouldn't be using, I don't think we should be using the word aerosol for viral isolates that appear from the tears or the aqueous. It can be confusing to the listener. So viral isolates from the tears we take care of with betadine pre-op. As Rohit so, so very well showed, aqueous is not really a problem and uh, it is very quickly uh, exchanged with BSS during cataract surgery. So I really don't think that would be a big problem. Any other thoughts? The whole thing about uh, this is about how big is your uh, droplets or aerosol which can carry your virus. What we realize is during the microkeratome, the, the droplets or aerosols, whatever you call them, are too close to 200 microns thicker. So that when they're heavier, the gravity pulls them down. So they fall down immediately. You don't need to worry. The challenge here is when you have a smaller ones, uh, when you have less than 10 microns or 11 microns smaller, which you don't see, even with the two thousand. This is what I showed was 20,000 frames per second photography. So you can't pick up that. What happens is it flies far, far away, and that only can be done if you do a computational modeling based on your airflow velocity of your clinic, which I will share with all of you so that uh, you know exactly based on your size of your room, you can actually think, I mean, you can look at how far they can do. So basically, at this point of time, the fear is more than the evidence. So what we are trying to do, especially in country like ours, when there's a lot of numbers, so we assume that everybody is a COVID and we assume that everybody has to be taken precautions. So sometimes it may be an overkill, but that's the, the way I think we have to be safe. Mm. Yeah. And the I last think that if you put betadine in the eye before they come in, it, it pretty much kills all the bacteria. Uh, and the virus, I mean. So even if you're, you know, throwing all the plume all over the place, it's really all killed virus. So I don't think you need to worry too much. I mean, you know, if you're that concerned, mm -hmm. perhaps you can do your your smile and your LASIK, uh, you know, do your smile first and do your LASIK, you know, PTK at the end of the end of your your list, so that it, you know it won't be kind of infecting other people. But I I, I really don't think it's a problem. You know, the the beta dean should kill the virus and whatever gets sprayed around is really uh, non non infectious and you know if you're careful with removal of your protective wear and uh, you know the patient's things and, and closed bin i think it's good enough and many oncologists i know are using betadine for themselves 0.25 percent when they see uh -huh. patients it is used as a prophylaxis by the doctors also many places Okay. Can, can I ask what? as an aside, are any of you guys taking chloroquine in any form? No. No? Well, no. <laughs> Thank you. Informed <Yeah. laughs> inform panel, neither am I. I want my right. macular to work. Thomas, <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was another question. And um, how about LASIK with the possibility of virus in tears, even in a symptomatic patients? Is there a possibility for viral keratitis? So it addresses the, the tear film and the infection uh, via tears and the possibility of uh, keratitis for, for this situation. I think the manifestations of this COVID on, in the eye is mostly conjunctivitis. I'm not aware of any keratitis. Um, I, I think it's just purely conjunctivitis. Okay. One thing we have to know that 
the after the conjunct after the nasal mucosa the second largest space for uh, ace2 inhibitors which the virus goes in is conjunctiva and cornea the corneal cells and conjunctival cells has exactly the same amount of ace2 inhibitors it's sorry ace2 receptors as you see in uh, so they can just be there and do nothing also but uh, we don't know over time we might have somebody coming with a keratitis post lasik and it might be linked to covid but at this point of time we need to know that the receptors are all there sure okay thank you it is connected uh, with the with the way we are uh, measuring the intraocular pressure uh, in the guides they were advising us not to use the air path chronometers because of the possibility of uh, spreading uh, i would like to ask the panel what are you doing now because we think we are we are changing our mind and we we're starting using the air path chronometer again uh, we use the eye care at the peak of the infection but we're now back to the um, and with the puff the nct we just clean the 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 surface you know the patient wear a mask obviously and then we clean the surface every time a for a different patient obviously we try not to measure unless we have to uh, uh you know minimize our tonometry we we did the same experiment the uh, past uh, photography with uh, the non contact tonometry we did 80 times we repeated the experiment and we did not get a single aerosols coming out of the eye of any kind as uh -huh. low as we looked at as low as 8 microns aerosol which is completely you cannot see with any camera so now we gone back to using safely uh, the non contact tonometry we are just going to publish it Uh, the non contact tonometry releasing aerosols i think was i don't think it was true only time you get an aerosol which i think all of us should know here is the first day post op when the patient has still a watery eye so if we avoid a watery eye or you do it just after the patient has put a drops or you do it when your patient is dilating when the eye has got more wet wetness only then you get one or two small droplets of 10 to 12 microns but otherwise they hardly see any aerosol and we repeated it 80 times okay. thank you another issue which is related uh, what we are talking now is the use of multi dose uh, eye drops are you changing to meaning to only dose or are you still using multi dose uh, eye drops Yeah, we're we're using multi-dose eye drops. I mean, you, you're just infecting yourself. You're not spreading the disease to everybody. But uh, you're talking also about the clinic uh, when you're dilating uh, patients. Yeah, um, we we use multi-dose. We're not using minims, mm. but we're quite careful. We change the bottle every day, so every day we use a new bottle, and we make sure we don't touch the tip. So. Uh, you know and and we're very wary of how we put the drops in try not to touch the patient's mask and and you know <laughs> what what is the reason now to use minim is the availability the problem the price of the minim because it it seems logical to change to minim in this situation don't you think so yeah sure i mean would give you extra protection of course hmm. There was a, another question by the by the audience about the impact on corneal transplants. So, is the virus surviving in the donor corneas? Should the patient have been infected? Is there any policy of delaying, postponing uh, corneal transplants, uh, or or shall the 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 donor be a scrutiny for for uh, COVID positive? Do you have any comments on that? So in the in the UK, um, the number of donors available has gone down uh, by about 90%. percent. Um, and I think the reason for this is that uh, first of all, there are less patients on ITU dying of things that are not on the intensive care unit. Less patients dying from things that are non-COVID because there's less elective surgery. You know, major kind of 
um, vascular surgery and things where they normally maybe donor patients are rising from this. Um, and they expect the volumes of donors to go back up maybe in August or September. So there's going to be a there's a big um, problem with donor material precisely because um, when someone is COVID positive, um, obviously those patients they cannot be those corneas can't be used for uh, for, for corneal donation. Um, they have changed in England now to an opt out policy, so they're trying to just generally increase availability of organ donation so unless someone specifies that they don't want to use their organs for donation it becomes uh, it becomes uh, automatic so hopefully when the pandemic is over there'll be more availability than there was before but at the moment we're in a situation where there is a hugely reduced availability of tissue but beyond the availability there may be also donors uh, so uh, people passing away and they may have been asymptomatic in terms of COVID and they were never tested for it. So how do you control that those little amount of donors are safe in a sense? I think they are now testing. They are including the test for COVID-19 along with the other viruses that they routinely screen donor material for. Okay, thank you. All right. I think we are uh, running out of time because we almost go ahead now for two hours. So, John, I would like to give you the last word for the as moderator. Well, I I just like to thank all the uh, the panel and the participants. Um, I've certainly learned a lot. I've been um, very uh, um, let's say I haven't really made up my mind about masks until sitting here this morning and uh, now I'm frightened of getting viruses off my computer so I'll uh, certainly start wearing a mask when I go out in public. Uh, just thank you everyone and thank you for bringing the knowledge and uh, I also think that we need a big thank you to all the personnel that have been involved in trying to contain this in all the various countries. Uh, they've all done an absolutely fantastic job. And uh, I'm sure you're all dying to get back to surgery when the situation uh, eases. But thank you again. And thanks, Schwent, for organizing this at 5.30 in the morning UK time. <laughs> yeah, thank you to each and every one from all of you and all attendees and uh, stay safe and have a good day.